Welcome to the Raising Them Ready podcast for parents. Here we encourage and support parents who are doing the best they know how to raise their kids to become confident, capable, and kind in today's ever-changing and often unpredictable world. I'm Jonathan Catherine. I'm a family man, career sociologist, and best-selling author of life skills and character building books for tweens, teens, young adults, and parents. And thanks to the success of the Raising Them Ready book my wife Erica and I wrote together, I'm now also hosting this, the Raising Them Ready podcast for parents. Play is such an important part of every kid's childhood. It's through playing with siblings, the neighbor kids, old friends and new that our children learn creativity, practice getting along with others, and have spontaneous fun playing in backyards, side yards, cul-de-sacs, empty lots, fields, and forests. But oh, how times are changing. One generation ago, the universal rule was play outside until dark or a parent called you home for dinner. Yet today, young children, tweens, and teens are spending next to no time outside as screen time indoors has replaced riding bikes, building forts, climbing trees, and playing out until the streetlights come on. So on this episode of the Raising Ready podcast, Jenny Yurk and I talk about why a return to playing outside is so good for kids. Jenny is an author, speaker, and founder of the Thousand Hours Outside Movement. As a mom of five kids, she's all about less screen time and more green time for the entire family. Practicing what she's teaching, Ginny's family spends over a thousand hours each year playing, learning, and working outside and unplugged. So welcome to my playful conversation with Ginny York about how being outside is such an important part in parenting kids who grew up to become confident, capable, and kind. I know you're going to be inspired by her passion for being the kind of parent who sends their kids outside to play and joins them too. A return to play in a thousand hours outside is what Jenny and I are talking about on this episode of the Raising Them Ready podcast for parents. I remember growing up as a kid, the worst thing my parents could say to me was go inside and go to your room. That meant I had to come in from play and just be confined in this space. And it just, it broke me. It broke me every time. Mm -hmm. What has happened that we have flipped the switch? It's completely 180 degrees now. The worst thing you tell a kid now is go outside. What has happened? A whole lot has happened. And it's really sad. The, The whole situation is that there's no kids outside anymore. So that is what would draw you outside, right? The possibility. Who's going to be out there? Who can I play with? There's going to be so much to do. And now when a child looks out the window, there's no one out there. There's nothing going on. And so sometime in the 90s, we had this really big shift where we're focusing on academics and all of a sudden parenting feels like we're in a race and we've changed the nature of parenting where we think, oh my goodness, I have to use these 18 years to prepare, prepare, prepare because the colleges seem like they're getting more exclusive, even though they're not, you know, there's all sorts of games going on with that. So we've got this academic piece. We've got this piece where we're trying to put kids into extracurricular activities. We've got the screens and the screens are becoming more immersive. And so all of a sudden we have these kids whose lives are filled and there's no one out to play. And this is a whole new thing. So as as kids, we played by default. That was the only option. There wasn't other things to do. That's how society was set up. And so I don't even think anybody thought about it. I don't think parents thought about it. I don't think kids thought about it. It was just how things were structured. Nobody knew that actually it was really beneficial. Actually, all of that stuff that seemed frivolous and we didn't know that that actually all of that free time and that downtime and that self-structured time is helping kids in every facet of their development with lifelong benefits. So many parents today are like trying to get their kids into a form of play that's structured. Yeah. It's the sports. It's let's schedule a play date. Uh, what club are they in at school? These are all structured versions of play. Yeah. Whereas I remember when the doorbell would ring or someone would knock on the back gate Aww. and that was, can Jonathan come out and play? Some of my favorite words to hear was, Jonathan, can you come out and play? And there was no structure to it. We would just grab our bikes and go. What are we going to do? Fishing poles, BB guns. What's what's the story? We don't even know. We're going to make it up as we adventure through the woods, down the block, around the cul-de-sac. Okay, so I get the yeah. kids aren't doing that today. And as a sociologist, I study this stuff. In fact, I wrote a whole book about the tipping point where technology changed our cultural engagement between the generations and how we view play and how we view work. And and so I get that. I know we also moved from the front porch to the backyard. 
A lot of families now mm -hmm. go in through the garage. You open the door, you pull the car in, or you wade your way through all the stuff crammed in your garage, and you go in through the through the garage door. I understand that we're moving away from kind of this concept that we are collectively a whole and more into individual options, mm -hmm. including the way we play. What's that doing to our kids? Obviously, we know that they're struggling. That's what the research shows. But if we're to talk about like a specific example, and this is a really something to think about. I talked to this young man. His name is Sean Killingsworth. You would really like to talk to him. He's in his early 20s. And he talks about how, you know, he was this guinea pig generation where everyone's handing out the screens. All of a sudden, the kids are on video games all the time. And he, in a very somber way, talks about how he lost his childhood. And he says, you know, I was so excited to be a teenager. I was so excited to go to the mall. I was excited to go to parties. I was excited to be in high school. And even starting in elementary school, he shares stories of how he would go to these after school clubs and every single kid would be on a Game Boy, every single one. And he would be like, There's, there was no one for me to play with. He called it a social wasteland. And so he talks about this loss, this extreme loss that he didn't get to have the conversations in the hallways after classes because everyone is on their phones. Everyone is on their phone at lunch. You can't be yourself because you might be videotaped at any moment and that could be shared to your entire school. That when we really take a step back and think about it and we, when we talk about these prime years of ours, I mean, what a thing to say, Jonathan, that one of your favorite things to hear was, can Jonathan come out to play? And to know that our kids are not experiencing that, maybe ever, that your favorite thing, going to go fishing and having that freedom, someday our kids are going to ask. They're going to ask why. Why didn't you limit my screen time? Why didn't you push me out to play? Because this self-structured, this child-directed, you know, I think you bring up such a good point. It's like, you know, you're, you're of this podcast, you're talking to parents, we're trying to raise capable kids, confident kids. Well, how can you be confident if you don't ever make the decisions? If you don't have the opportunity to say, yes, I like this, I'm going to do this, that didn't work out. I'm going to play around with these different ideas. You enter adulthood completely unprepared for life. Unpracticed. Yes, you haven't had experiences. And a, a practical example of that would be there's this woman named Dr. Jean Twangy. So she studied these changes from, you know, the baby boomers and Gen X and all of this. And she has a phenomenon book called iGen, which stands for Internet Generation. She's also a college professor. And so she says, all of a sudden, these kids are coming to college and she says they can't even make simple decisions without texting their parents. So we want to talk about raising confident kids, capable kids. The way that you do that is you give them some time that they call their own in order to start to practice. Like you said, that's the the great word to practice making their own decisions. Well, I love how you have this thousand hours outside movement, thousand hours outside a year, which is like two hours yep. and 44 minutes. I did the math. Two hours and 44 minutes a day outside in free play. Mm -hmm. But yet the research shows kids are only spending between four and seven minutes a day outside playing. So it's an average. It's an average of four to seven minutes a day. And I wonder if most of the week they're not outside at all. And a couple times a week they go outside for 20 or 30 minutes. And it's averaging out to be about four to seven minutes a day in free play but they're on screens for four to seven hours. And those statistics are kind of old. So I think things bumped up with the pandemic and- Oh yeah, we're looking at kids having screen time between seven, eight, nine, up to 10 hours a day. So that's, that's just, yeah. that's too much. That's too much. Okay, so we know yeah. that there's a problem. And I know the parents who are listening to this right now are saying, yeah, I know. I used to play outside all the time. Yeah. But today, let's just face it. If we can't have eyes on our kids- we're a little bit worried. Yet my mom insisted that she couldn't see the fort that we were building from the house. In fact, she nicknamed our fort Tacky Construction Company because it was the worst construction <laughs> on the planet. Nails sticking out everywhere. How I didn't get tetanus, I don't know. But if she couldn't see it, then we could do it. But today, wow. a parent needs to be able to you know, quickly look out the window into the backyard to see their kids play. We even have video monitors in our backyards to keep track of our kids. And trackers on their phones, and we stick little pods in their backpacks. We know where they are at all times. I completely agree with you. Being outside, playing outside, the freedom to explore and to be creative changes the way our kids interact in the world around them, both now when they're young and as they grow up and grow older. 
But let's talk about that social interaction. What is the benefits of being outside socially for our kids? Mm, well, there's a really good book about that called Playborhood, where the author talks about how the most enticing thing outside is not your play structure. It is not your trampoline if you have one or anything like that. The most enticing thing is other kids. So this looks different than it used to. And what it looks like for us, and I, some neighborhoods, the kids are still out playing. Most neighborhoods, they're not. And so that Mike Lanza, who wrote this book, Playborhood, he recommends putting as much of your play stuff as you can in the front yard instead of the backyard. So that like you were talking about, it's like the houses aren't even being made with front porches anymore. Like we have to see people out there. And I think that a parent has to know if you let your kid play outside and in the front yard, and maybe you do sit out there, maybe you sit out and read a book, do yard work, you work in your garden, but you can see without having to intervene. When you let your kids play, when you let your kids go knock on the door and say, you know, is so-and-so home, you're doing something for that child that they're gonna remember long into adulthood. What happens when kids play outside and especially in a neighborhood type play situation, or maybe you stick around after school, you know, maybe you have four or five families that say, we're gonna stick around after school for an hour, 45 minutes, let our kids play at the playground and you've got this multi-age situation. Your kids are learning all of the nuances of social relationships. So we have to know how to be assertive, but not too assertive. So as to turn somebody off, we have to learn how to negotiate and compromise and come up with something from nothing to be imaginative, to form rules, rules of the game. So pick up sports are such a fun part of childhood. We did pick up sports as kids. We would go to this little baseball field that was in our neighborhood. I mean, there was nothing there. And you would put, you know, your hoodies in different spots or whatever for the bases. And you would come up with new rules every time, depending on how many kids were there. Where's the outfield? Someone's gonna be the pitcher the whole time. All of these different things. And it takes a lot of skill to negotiate in a way that keeps everyone playing. And to your point from the very beginning, kids want to play that is how they are wired the worst thing is when the play ends when they're sent to their room when they have to go inside and so they naturally give themselves boundaries in fact they say that there's hardly ever any injuries in pickup sports and kid directed sports because they have put in all of this time to figure out the nuances of it and so they don't hurt their friend because if they hurt their friend all of the work that they put in is over so kim john payne he wrote a book called simplicity parenting he says the primary predictor of success and happiness in life and i know this is what your podcast is geared for we're talking about raising our kids ready so how do we have our kids be ready for life and the primary predictor of success and happiness he says is our ability to get along with others and kids learn that. They don't learn that when they're told what to do all the time. They learn that in those moments where they're having to negotiate and, and give in or learn how to you know, state their case and sell their idea to somebody else. They are learning so much in mixed age play is doing a lot for our kids too. The kids are looking up to the older ones. The older ones are learning how to nurture. There's a lot going on in those situations too. My favorite examples of what you just said about the mixed age play. Our sons um, kind of ruled the neighborhood with the younger kids. And I mean ruled like, not like like they were the bosses, but they would organize the play. Everything from uh, adventures through the woods to uh, to kick the can to videos on Thanksgiving Day because we had such a huge gathering every year for Thanksgiving with all the neighbor kids at our place. And then they put on a production and, and show us their video that mixed age play where you have the ability to near peer mentor and share and, and God, I love that. That was some of my favorite parts of, of our neighborhood here growing up. We moved into um, a, a large neighborhood that one of the reasons we moved from like, you know, more rural to more suburban is because we want our kids to be able to roll out the door and play with their friends. And now yeah. that they're adults, they tell us stories about what they used to do, which in a way horrify me, but yet they're fine, you know, but we weren't neglecting yeah. them because they were with their friends. They didn't have cell phones. Mm -hmm. They just went out and played. If there was a problem, they came back and usually muddied mm -hmm. and slightly bloodied, uh, but always okay <laughs> because they were with others. That would be a good book title, muddied, wouldn't it? Muddied, muddied and bloodied. And bloodied. <laughs> That's a great chapter for, yeah, I like that. Let's, let's, let's work on that together. Muddied and bloodied. <laughs> Again, let's go back to what we can do to help our kids get outside and play more often. 
there's a lot of different situations and depending on where people live and if the other kids are outside or not. Some simple things would be to take your normal inside things and move them outside. And obviously that depends on time of year, where you live, that type of thing. But you can take your inside stuff outside. You could take your laundry folding. You could take your schoolwork. You could take your reading. You could take your meals. You can take those things and move them outside. And what happens when you do that is you're exposed to that full spectrum of sunlight. And people talk about what's happened with us too. It's like, well, then all of a sudden something entices your kid or you, you end up moving because something's out there and you wanna go see it. And sometimes a 20 minute meal turns into an hour that your family is outside making memories or doing some different things. What that has meant for me as a mother is that a lot of our outside time is calling up friends or having a regular place where we meet and the kids, have their freedom and they're playing and they're in their own space and the moms maybe are out on the periphery and we're building community too and we're also getting those benefits of getting outside so you know that would look like when our kids were young we'd maybe meet up for a, a one mile hike and that takes forever when you have little kids because they find things that they want to do and they want to build something and they're they're entertained and and you get to build that social fabric that i think that we're missing as well and also combating the technological lives that we live in too. So there was a period of my life where I was um, green with envy and kind of annoyed actually that I was a mom at this time when screens had become so pervasive. And I was like thinking, oh, you know, if I had been a mom in the 90s, I could have just shoved my kids out the door and I could have kept my house cleaner and I could have maybe made more elaborate meals. I don't know what those moms were doing. They weren't outside with the kids, they were inside. And so I was for a long time, like, ah, oh, you know, <laughs> I'm the, a mom a couple decades too late. But really truthfully, if I think about it, my life has been very enhanced by our time outside. I've been outside just as much as our kids. And so that's a different way to look at it is to say, if we're, you know, if we're dealing with a little bit of the fear and, the neighborhood and our kids roaming free. You could be out on the front porch too, or you could be sitting out on the front lawn, or you could be calling up some friends and, and doing things together that are in nature, that are enhancing the lives of everyone from the youngest all the way up through the parents. And it really does give you a sense of a fuller life because you're infusing all of these new memories and new situations into your day to day that may not have been there in generations past. Right, so you're not just talking about sending your kids outside. What you just said is let's mm -hmm. go outside. So instead of, yeah. all right, everybody out. I remember my mom used to say that and then she'd lock the door occasionally. Yeah. And we couldn't come back in, right? <laughs> but everybody out. Yes. Now it's when you when you say everybody out, that includes you. Yeah, I think a lot of times it does. And I think that's the big change. And, I, you know, there's ab absolutely something to be said about kids at the right age being out and having freedom. There's a lot of books about that. Lenore Skenazy has one called Free Range Kids. And even that Dr. Peter Gray, who talks about mixed age play, he says that the age, now he's, I don't know how old he is, maybe he's in the 60s or 70s, but he talks about how the age of, you know, like this kid is ready and, and has some agency and can make some decisions and is okay to be on their own for a little bit, used to be four, <laughs> four, four that the kid would walk to the corner store by themselves and that's the trust level that was placed at that time and so you know there's definitely something to be said at least to let like your 10 year old you know he says you know the the 10 and 12 year olds don't even have as much freedom as the four year olds used to have so there's something to be said about a child getting that freedom with a group of friends there's safety in numbers not when they're completely on their own but they've got the safety in numbers that that feels amazing to yeah. them. There's that confidence, right? That you're instilling that confidence in them. But you know, then there's also this other piece of you can do it as a community, you can get together with a couple other families and have that mixed age thing, especially if you don't live in a neighborhood, maybe, maybe you live in the city, and you're going to meet up at the, the corner park or something like that. And so there's a, a lot of different ways to try and incorporate outside time into your family. So in our book, Raising Them Ready, one of the sections of the book discusses you have to have a release plan for your kids. And we don't let them go at 18 or 19 or 20. We need to start letting them go at two. Now, I know that there are now listeners going, what? Because they haven't read the book yet. But here's what we mean by that. You need to let your kids go a little at a time over time. Give them instruction and then release them to do what it is you instructed them. Come alongside of them and give them guidance and then release them and let them practice. And as they mature, they'll eventually come back and seek your counsel 
which you will provide, but then you got to let them go. So it's instruction, release, guidance, release, counsel, release. Now, again, I can share there's two camps right now listening, two groups of parents. One is completely floored by what we're saying. And there's others are saying, when I was their age, you're right. I walked to the school bus by myself. I walked to school by myself. I went to the mm -hmm. store by myself. I did. I think it's all has a lot to do with our kids' uh, willingness and ability. And that's a mm -hmm. process they have to practice. It, yeah. it, it can't just be a you go. It's got to be something parents, we instruct them, guide them, and counsel them. In. And you got to let them go. Let them go give it a try safely. Yeah, safely. I think so. I mean, there's, there's actually, I learned it from um, this man named Christopher Chin who is like this adventure photographer. So he's got this um, on like the masterclass platform. He has this thing where, you know, he's like skiing down the mountain and also getting the photography shot. And so it's like this whole skill set that he has. And he talks in that masterclass about the calculation of risk. And that risk is an actual calculation, like a mathematical calculation that we make extremely quickly. And it's it's weighing these two factors. The first one is, how dangerous is this? And the second one is, how likely is it to happen? And those are the two factors that contribute to how risky something is. So if we talk about that in parenting terms, it's like, well, how risky is it to let a young child play near a body of water when they can't swim by themselves? Well, how dangerous is it extremely, right? That, you know, they could die. And how likely is that to happen? Very likely. How, you know, how likely is it if you let a small child play near a busy road with a ball? You know, how dangerous is that? Extremely. How likely is something to happen? Very. But, you know, if you're in the woods and your kid climbs up onto a log and they want to jump off, well, how dangerous is that? Hardly at all. I mean, they're, they might get scraped. How likely are they going to get bumps and bruises? Probably very likely, but it's not very dangerous. And so, Really, I look at parenting similar to you. It's like it's this passing of the baton of this this calculation of risk. I think that for a long time, your kids are toddlers, they're babies, they're three years old, they're four years old. We are calculating that for them. But eventually, they have to be the ones that can do it. And so day by day, this is what we both need because it sure is hard i would imagine our oldest is 15 but it would be so hard to, to throw your kid out into the world when you when you as a parent don't know what they're capable of it's for both of us right they are learning what they're capable of and we're also learning what they're capable of so that we can be confident when we launch them that they're going to be okay. And so this is really for both of us. I loved how you said it. It's a little, a little over time. You're passing off that baton and the benefits are for both of you because at some point and you're in that spot, they're going to leave and you have to be okay with that. Yeah. I'm not advocating four-year-olds walk to 7-Eleven on their own. You're going to have a police officer <laughs> on your front porch guaranteed. Sure. But let's say you have some property and you, your 15 year old wants to go out with his buddies and make a fire pit and camp out overnight. It's probably not the first time that they've gone camping. The first time we went camping with our boys was in our living room. And then it was in the backyard. Now I have an Eagle Scout that camps in the wilderness on his own. It's that wow. a little at a time over time and letting go one step at a time. You're right. I think it's it's a process that as parents, you know, there's a saying I, I believe in that, that parenting never goes as planned, but no one should parent without a plan. So mm -hmm. parents, I think part of your plan needs to be get your kids outside, join them outside, mm -hmm. move into a little less screen time, a lot more green time, get it, an idea of how they're doing and how we're doing. Yes. Yes. Are we capable of letting go? Yeah. So many parents just can't let go. It's not their kid's deal. It's the parent's deal. Yeah. And nature, nature and growth, The I think the premise of nature and getting kids outside gives them the opportunity to little by little try harder things. And so- they're learning what their bodies can do. And at the same time, we're learning to let go. And it's this beautiful passage of time where we we pass the decision-making over to them in small increments. Wonderful. Okay, things kids should know how to do outside. I, I think for sure, kids need to learn how to ride a bike and they need to learn how to swim. Anything else mm -hmm. on a short list that for sure kids should learn how to do outside? I think those are two big ones and they're fun ones. Those are really fun milestones. You know, when you talk about development and the brain, as kids learn more complex things, their brains continue to develop and they form new wiring. 
we sometimes forget that after a child learns how to walk, there are still a lot more opportunities for complex movement. Riding a bike is a great example. Swimming is a great example. Casting a fishing pole, shooting hoops, riding a skateboard. So this opportunity for moving in complex ways grows with your kids when they have the time and the space to engage in different types of outdoor activities. I think every kid should know how to roast a marshmallow. Do you burn I, it? No, I, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> I, it's it like it tans up. It's like perfectly crusted. Oh, yeah, it's the best. But every mm -hmm. kid needs to know how to do that, which I then back up and say, I think every kid <laughs> needs to learn how to light a fire properly. It's a never ending pool of options. There's so many different types of things that you can learn outside. And all of these things offer an endless amount of learning opportunities. Skipping rocks. We sell like two yeah. old people right now. Jump, jump rope. rope. Yeah. Jump rope. Every kid should learn how to jump rope and skip <laughs> rocks. <laughs> we used to count how many skips on on like a rock on a pond as well as how many mm -hmm. times you could skip jump rope yeah mm -hmm. four square i mean those things were so fun and it's really good for your development we bought our kids big boxes of, of sidewalk chalk and then would turn the front driveway mm -hmm. into four square and obstacle courses and so this is a push i have for parents is um don't hog your driveway you know, be because your big SUV just sits there parked doesn't mean it's not the perfect playground for your kids. Move the car to the street, to a different space mm -hmm. so that the kids can play in the driveway. And and don't be upset when you come out and, and you're like, oh my goodness, look at all this just chalk all over. Or look at all the bikes strewn everywhere. You know, wonderful, celebrate. Favorite story, one of my favorite stories. I used to travel a lot. Mm -hmm. And I came home from a very long business trip and I was exhausted and all I could think about was just getting home and trying to decompress. And I come around the corner and there in my driveway blocking the entrance is like a dozen bicycles. <laughs> and my first thought was, darn kids. You know, and then immediately I got this, like something sparked in me. And it's like this little joy bubble burst. And I'm like, this is the mm -hmm. best ever. Because that was how, when I was growing up, I knew where my friends were. And so, yeah, I, you know, park mm -hmm. on the curb and come inside and just a house full of kids. And I'm like, this is the best ever driveways blocked with bikes. I love it. Aww. Yeah. Over the last 10 years, you spent over a thousand hours a year outside. What's that done for mm -hmm. you as a family? Well, it just gets more fun and more fun. And I think that's an interesting part of the whole journey. So often things change, you know, we're dealing with different stages and different issues and they're, they're little or they're biting. We're trying to get them to be potty trained. We're trying to get them to sleep through the night. Like you have all these different things and you master it. And then that issue is done and over with. You don't ever have to deal with it again. So it almost feels like this waste of a skill. But with getting kids outside, the research says it's necessary. The average kid should be outside is about three hours a day. And that's for all ages of kids. That includes your teens that are in AP classes and that are in extracurricular activities and that are sending out college applications. The nature time is important for them just as it's important for the babies. So over time, this has looked like, okay, I'm literally carrying all three kids because they're all fussy and whiny. And I've got, you know, one on the front, one on the back and one on my arm. And I'm pushing the stroller that has all of our stuff with the other hand down the trail. I mean, that's what it looked like at the beginning. Well, what it looks like now is that everyone is confident and capable. So we can go do really expansive and fun, like even fun for an adult. So our youngest is seven. She turned seven this summer. So she can go whitewater rafting now. Like she's hit that minimum age. You know, we can go on these more expansive hikes, we can do things that are a little bit more difficult. So, I mean, at the beginning, it was great. It's beautiful. You're out in nature. Your kids are engaged. You get a little bit of an exhale. And then as they grow, because they have learned how to use their bodies well, which these are the types of skills that um, you can't measure them, right? Like stamina and engagement and joy. Those things grow when you spend time outside. Decision making, problem solving, you talked about that earlier. So, you know, they have good stamina. You can go on longer hikes and you can see things that maybe you wouldn't have been able to see otherwise. So it weaves together to give a sense of a full life. And Richard Louv says, Something like nature amplifies time. Like television steals time, nature amplifies time. And it's true. Your time outside, all that sensory input, it makes your life feel more full and more enjoyable. Right. We have a lot of people listening to this podcast who are in urban environments. 
And so they can hear us talking about camping and hiking and they're like, yeah, it's just like a concrete jungle here. We have to remember that no matter where you live, there are pros and cons. So if you live in the city, there's a lot of places you can walk to. And Dan Butner, who uh, is from, he's got like a National Geographic show that just came out. He talks about living to be into your hundreds. He studied all like these centenarians and these different places in the world. And he says, one of your best things is to be in an area that's walkable. And so if you live in the city, you live in a place that's walkable. So you could walk to your grocery, you could walk to the library maybe. My brother lives in Brooklyn. There's a lot of these corner playgrounds, you can walk to those. But then you're, you know, you're missing out maybe on that neighborhood option. You're missing out on a farm or like you said, camping out in the backwoods. So there's pros and cons to living there. I had a interview one time with Dylan Dreyer on the Today Show and she showed, she's like, look out my window. I'm on the fourth floor. I'm in the middle of the city. But I tell you what, there was birds and trees everywhere. She turned her whole computer to show me. And there was like the spring and the trees were budding and there's birds. And, you know, um, there's a Dr. Scott Sampson. He says, nature is everywhere thrusting up in the, you know, the cracks of the sidewalk. You know, if you're in a suburbia, you've got this neighborhood component, maybe, but you're, you're not in a walkable area quite so much, right? You don't have the option to walk to the grocery store or something like that. And if you're in a rural area, you've got all the space, you've got the space to roam, but there's no kids. So there's pros and cons to no matter where you live. And there are ways to to get benefits of full spectrum sunlight and the surround sounds of nature and all of that, no matter where you live. And okay, so let's also talk about um, bumps, bruises, scratches, and scars. Yay, good for those. <laughs> this is the part of childhood. I mean, I think that's why our bodies are made to heal. And, you know, we might have a scar. I mean, my kids have some scars. We have them. And their stories. Our scars tend to be stories. And, and I think a lot of people like theirs. You know, they tell the story of when this happened or I did that or the other thing. But what's happening is this is where we're learning the risk, right? Like our our bodies are learning what they can and can't do. And there's this man... Um, his name is Joel Salatin, and he's a grandpa. He's a farmer in Virginia in the Shenandoah Valley. And he just came out with a book called Homestead Tsunami. And he's talking in that book about our immune systems and that we're, we're built to have a little bit of an assault on our bodies so that our bodies can stay sharp, basically. So he talks about, you know, like getting out, getting dirty, getting in the dirt, um, you know, eating some fruit from your garden or vegetables from your garden that you didn't completely sanitize and wash off. But he also says he loves to get little scrapes here and there and be out in the brambles and come in, you know, with all these scratches, he said, because this is building my immune system. My body is having to work to fix those things. And so I just thought, like as an adult, I'm like trying to avoid as much as possible any scrape or any bruise, but I thought that was an interesting perspective. It's giving our bodies a chance to work and to work the way that they're meant to. And so it is, it's just part of childhood. We call them summer knees. You know, where the, like the whole summer, their knees are scabbed, but that is a sign that they're learning how their bodies are working as they grow. It's like they start really small, close to the ground. And so this is once again, that little by little bits of growth where they learn that they're confident and capable. And I think, you know, some knee scrapes and some scrapes on the elbows, those are a great sign that your kids are learning what they need to be learning about their bodies. I've never met a parent who does not want their child to grow up to be resilient. Yet, in order to be resilient, you need to engage and encounter resistance. There is no resilience without resistance. So having summer knees, scratched up right. knees, and dirty clothes and smudges on the face and a few tears, a few scratches, a few bruises, a few bumps, a mm -hmm. few scars is all an example of how we help our kids build resilience. And grit and grit. I think that that's a part of it too. There's this phenomenal book by Michael Easter called The Comfort Crisis. And the premise of the book is that all of a sudden, all we care about is being comfortable, that this is the end all be all. And he's like, well, this does not actually lead to a very fulfilling life because we're always flatlined. If you're always, you know, in 72 degree weather with no humidity and no bugs, you don't ever have the highs and lows. And so there's something to be said about getting out into that frigid cold and bundling up and it's kind of uncomfortable and the wind is whipping. But 45 minutes later, you come back in and you have a cup of hot chocolate and, and you feel you feel more alive. You feel so much different than if you just stay in the same all the time.
All right, you just inspired me to take my dog for a walk. It's like 28 degrees outside, and I'm going to do it. Yes, I'm do, do it. it. Do it so do good. It. There's a really good book called oh, 52 Ways to Walk by Annabelle Abs, And she, it's one of my favorite books. And she talks in there about all these different, like walking backwards and walking by water. And one of her things is getting out in the cold and how beneficial that is for so much of your body. And um, so it's an inspiring read for sure. But the cold weather, it does. You read stuff. a lot. You keep saying, <laughs> there's this really I great like book by. Okay. So let's talk about another really <laughs> great book by Ginny Urich. Until the street lights come on. Here's the premise. This is a message of hope that if we return to play, which is how kids used to do, a lot of kids would play until it got darker. They would play until the street lights come on. They had that freedom that if we return to play, it makes today better and also prepares kids for this future that is changing rapidly. And I think that's where we have gotten lost is that we have become a society in the last two decades, three decades, where we sacrifice today. We sacrifice the joy of today. We sacrifice the memories that we can make today for the sake of preparing for tomorrow. But the problem is tomorrow is changing. We don't live in this world where you're gonna have your career for 30 years. We live in this world where, oh, oops, okay, this new AI thing came out and now that job is obsolete. And you're gonna have to be on your toes and you're gonna have to be flexible and have grit and be able to take risks and change and the way that we set kids up for those types of scenarios is by giving them a lot of open space and so that makes our today better because it makes our kids better able to deal with boredom it makes them it's just a more enjoyable life and so the subtitle is how a return to play brightens our present and prepares kids for an uncertain future so like i said it's a message of hope that we can do less and gain more and really dive into these childhood years and enjoy them along with our kids while knowing and being confident that this is still preparing them for the world that they'll be entering when they become adults. I'm hoping that all of our listeners are going to hear themselves say within this next week, at least once a day, let's go outside and play. Take the dog, take the dog. <laughs> take the dog outside. Where can we find you online? How can listeners follow you on social media? What's the you know full range of the books you've published? Everything is just 1,000 hours outside. Um, we have a website, 1,000 hours outside, where we have these tracker sheets that are free to download. We have a podcast too, the 1,000 hours outside podcast, an app, a top rated app. It's the 1,000 hours outside app. So same sort of thing where you're keeping track, you're getting badges, just a little timer feature. It's a super fun app. It's got great reviews. I have three books <laughs> that are called 1000 hours outside, literally all the same title. So you're going to have to try and sort that out on your own. Some of those are on Amazon and some of them are just on our web store. But you know, this newest one has its own new title. So I have broken out of that. And then on social media, same thing. Everything is just 1000 hours outside. So I'm kind of easy to find. And also that's due to a lack of creativity. I, I, I would <laughs> beg to differ with you. You seem rather creative and full of lots of energy. Well, thank you. I know I just you know like those new ideas, although muddied and bloodied. We came up with bloodied that one during this conversation. So that's yep, a good You used one. to say uh, <laughs> when I was ranching in Texas, you beat up from the feet up. <laughs> Here we go. You've got a lot of them. The primary goal of yep, childhood. Yep. As long as it's not from a bully, it's from fun and it's from hard work. Yeah, it's okay yeah. to be muddied and bloodied, beat up from the feet up. Jenny, mm -hmm. thanks so much for spending time with us today. Thank you for the opportunity. I have so enjoyed being here. What an honor to be a part of your Raising Them Ready podcast. Thank you. Thank you for joining Jenny Urich and myself in today's conversation about being the kind of parent who sends their kids outside to play and joins them too. To learn more about Ginny's books, The Thousand Hours Outside Movement, or to book her to talk with your organization about how a return to play brightens our present and prepares our kids for an uncertain future, check out the links in the show notes. If you're enjoying and learning from this and the other episodes of the Raising Them Ready podcast, be sure to get a copy of the Raising Them Ready book. It's available wherever you buy your print, digital, or audio books. There you'll also find our other best-selling life skills and personal development books and resources for tweens, teens, young adults, parents, educators, and mentors. To book me as a guest speaker for your youth, parent, educator, or professional development, please send me a message through our social media pages or email me through our website. You can find, like, and follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Raising and Ready and on our website at RaisingThemReady.com. Also, please follow, share, and leave us up to a five-star review wherever you listen to this podcast. If you have questions, comments, or suggestions about topics or guests you'd like me to bring to the Raising and Ready podcast, I'd like to hear from you. 
contact me through our social media pages or website. Again, we're on Facebook and Instagram at Raising Them Ready and online at RaisingThemReady.com. Now, parents, go and enjoy raising your kids ready. Knowing your children's greatness tomorrow begins with your guidance today.